Speaking of fun stories, mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of things I wrote down that I wanted to. Oh, uh, yeah, by all means. And I was going to tell you to ask me about them, but instead. Um, um, so one of them was, uh, one of them was um, when, uh, when Sabu and I and Judge Dredd and Dango were all in USWA in 1991, mm -hmm. the summer of 91, we were brand new in the business, you know, we were babies. 20 years old, not even old enough to drink. One night in Nashville at the Congress Inn, a wrestler named Brickhouse Brown came to our room and he sat down on the bed and he said, gather around, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smarten you guys up to this industry that you guys are getting into. I'm going to tell you what you're really doing, you know? And he said, you know, you got a lot of talent. You guys have a good chance to, you know, really make it far. Um, you, you know, you need to know this. And he proceeded to tell us a story about him being in an elevator in WWE with Pat Patterson. And he said, um, uh, um, well, he went on to, to, to specifically, because I, I re-watched an interview with Brickhouse Brown and the words that he used were what stood out to me for a reason. Because he said that Pat said to him, you can make a lot of money here, kid. And then he said that on the elevator that Pat, I think Pat hit the button to stop the elevator and said, you know, it depends on uh, what decisions that you make and how far you want to go and how important it is to you. And then he started undoing Brickhouse Brown's belt on his pants. Oh, Brickhouse, Brickhouse grabbed his pants, said something defensive, like, fuck no, I don't do that. Opened the door and ran out. You know, he said he fucking ran. And uh, boom, lo and behold, he was uh, let go afterwards, right? And so anyway, Brickhouse Brown uh, was telling us this story. And he was telling us about uh, Mel Phillips, about the uh, ring announcer who was uh, molesting um, the ring, ring boys. boys. Yeah. Yes, sir. And he was telling us about the uh, steroids and he was telling us uh, about uh, Terry Garvin. And, and, and throughout my whole career, like I always reflect back on that, you know, like I hadn't seen him in forever. This is 91. Mm -hmm. But I always think like, man, I wonder why he took that upon himself to smarten the four of us up, take his time. Anyway, it was pretty impactful on us. In fact, I remember afterwards, I went to, uh, uh, I told my mom about this, you know what I mean? Oh, I, that's wow, yeah. how young I was. And, and after USWA dried up, um, I ended up going to South Atlantic uh, Pro Wrestling in Charlotte. And there was a couple of guys that were really nice. I was only there for a very short time, but a couple of, there was a wrestler house, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of guys, uh, Tommy Angel and uh, Gino, Jeff Husker, um, Trying to, I'm blanking on the other name, but I do pretty good, so I'm going to get myself... Yeah, that's break. pretty impressive, all nonetheless, Rob. <laughs> uh, these guys said, you know, we had a roommate in our house that just moved out, Rob. If you, you know, if you want, you know, you can... Uh, you got an extra bed or, or whatever. And, and so, you know, I told my mom that on the phone, and she was worried because what I told her about Brickhouse Brown. Yeah. And, and she was like, they're not gay, are they? And... Uh, <laughs> And, and I remember, like, after I talked to her when I was at the arena, I was so young, I repeated that to Tommy Angel. Like, I was in the bathroom, and he said, hey, did you give any thought to that about, you know, if you're going to want to take that, that uh, our extra room or not or whatever? And I was like, you guys aren't gay, are you? And, and I was like, I was half joking, you know? But uh -huh. then afterwards, looking back at it, I was like, man, that was really, like, a mean thing for me to – and it didn't matter if they were gay, but, you know, that was, like – that was just what my mom had said based on the story of of the gay wrestlers that were using their authority, you know, to uh, to manipulate people's careers. So it's not about the gay part, but that's just the way it was worded. But I always look back at that and it's like, man, those guys are really cool offering me that. What an asshole thing to say to them. But I was just really young and like I said, halfway joking. I didn't even know how to wash dishes. I was so young. Didn't know, you know, they were like, Rob, can you help out a little bit? And I was like, um, I think I'm gonna move out. And uh, <laughs> yeah. um, But anyway, that always stuck in my mind. A couple of years ago at Cauliflower Alley Club, uh, we got to meet Brickhouse Brown. 
mm-hmm. right before he, shortly before he died. And you know, he was he was blind and uh sick, and he asked me, Do I remember that time that he sat? Remember that baby? Yeah. She knows she was there with oh. me. Do I remember that? And I'm like, you remember? Why the fuck would you remember that? You've seen pictures of me when I started out, had the short blonde hair, the the blue trunks. That wasn't Rob Van Dam. I didn't think he would even remember I was that same kid. Why yeah. the fuck would he? You know? But he was like, do you remember that time you guys came through Nashville? And he said, I sat you guys down, and I, and I told you all this stuff. And then he goes, it all came out, didn't it? It all came out later. And I was like, yeah, you know, you're, yeah, you know. And, I mean, we didn't doubt you. We knew you were shooting us straight. Um, the reason that those words were so relevant recently, that when I re-listened to his interview, um, th- when I got to WWE in 2001, you know, Pat Patterson was working there. He had been rehired. They were, he was keeping himself, you know, behaving. A lot of the popular wrestlers really liked him, said what a good guy he was, got along with them. First-hand experience, you know, I, nothing was going, happening to me. So it was weird to think back about these crimes that are alleged and to think about how could anybody be okay with associating with these people. But sometimes it's just like, it is what it is, you know, and sometimes you can't control everybody that's in the room. And um, anyway, I remember one time in Pittsburgh, I was at the Mellon arena. Yeah. Home of the Penguins. Yes, sir. I was uh, at the urinal taking a piss and who walks in behind me with Pat Patterson. Yeah. You know what he says to me? Oh, he d- didn't he say the same thing that he said to Brickhouse? Wow. Kid, you're going to make a lot of money here. You're going to make a lot of money here, kid. And I said, if you say so. And he said, uh, well, wait a minute. What? I don't like the sound of that. I said, yeah, I don't either. And he said, you're, well, you're tell, what you're telling me right now is that you don't believe in yourself. I said, no, I believe in me. I just don't know if I believe that they're going to pay me a lot and that I'm going to get a lot of money here. You know, and I was pr- particularly pissed because I had just gotten like my first check shortly before that. Uh, and I got uh, my first house show was in Atlanta with Johnny. Um, um What's that? What's Johnny Stompanato? Not Johnny Stompanato. That's a mobster. That was, that was <laughs> Johnny Stompanato. Was uh, anyway. The, like, you want to be in the ring with him? Johnny Bull. Johnny the Bull. Oh, Johnny the Bull Stamboli. Okay. Stamboli, not Stompanato. That's why I went there. Um, Atlanta house show, WWE. Mm-hmm. Johnny the Bull. And my, my money was $500. And I mean, you know, I don't like to talk about money a lot. But yeah. throw, throw another zero on that. I was getting that before I went to WWE. Wow, so this yeah. is what I'm getting now, you know. And uh, anyway, things got a little better with the money. But the point was just when I heard uh, those words recently of Rick House Brown saying, you know, he, I think he said – but it was almost the same. I think he said, you know, uh, you can make a lot of money here, kid. And I think to me, he said, you're going to make a lot of money here, kid. You're going to make a lot of money here, kid. But anyway, that was him halfway going through his fucking uh, moves. And he just had to put the brakes on where where he was putting the brakes on at that time of his career, you know? Wow, yeah. That's crazy yeah. to think, too. Because I remember you telling the story because it was like you were talking about like Steve Austin strapping a rocket on your back and all that yeah. stuff. And then you told that story. And I remember you saying those words, too. And when he said that to Brickhouse, I was like, wait, didn't he say that to Rob, too, earlier? <laughs> so that's yeah. crazy. There's something else something else that, that reverberates a little bit in my brain um, is when... 
when um, I did the interview with Sean Oliver, the you shoot a long time ago, yeah, he had he had some a pick a hand segment, you know, where he went through a big list of wrestlers. Did you ever have to ask this guy to pick a hand? Did you ever have to ask this guy? And I, being unfiltered and genuine like I always am. You know, I told stuff that nobody knows about. Like, well, I did think about it with this guy, you know, but it didn't quite get there. And there was a few of those. And, and you know, one of them was Vince. Um, but I did sit outside his office waiting on him, and I was going to ask him to pick a hand. And uh, Paul Heyman talked me out of it. But I was there for, it seems like, 45 minutes at least, like a long, long time. Um, and I was, I was, I was upset. And it was about going to the um, uh, Qatar, you know, about going over to for the, yeah, with the military. For the mm-hmm. It was, and and yeah. Anyway, uh, when I was reading the comments, you know, somebody was saying something, you know, about oh, it seems like Rob wants to wants to beat up a lot of old men all the time, like a hothead. He seems like he'd be a dick, or you know, something like that. I was like, first off, Vince back then was like maybe my age now, as far as that goes. But um, besides that. Um, what it was about, and I've said this, and you've probably heard me say this, I've said this every single time when it got down to it, when I get that far to talking about when I was waiting to ask him, and I was literally, I thought that's what it was going to take mm-hmm. for him to understand that he didn't have that power over me as a person. I'm not going, Vince. I'm not going to go. I appreciate that, Rob. But you're going to see this is going to be a great experience for you. That offended me so much that I thought this guy thinks he owns me like I'm his property, like he can control me to that extent. And I think I'm going to have to smack him in order for him to understand that I don't feel that way. He doesn't control me and I'm willing to accept any consequences. And that just comes to the front of my brain with all the stuff that's going on now and to think about how somebody could possibly have that much of a, of a hunger for power and dominance over people. And, and like I said, I think last week, there's, there's like a whole culture of world elitists that, that view certain people as subhuman or beneath them, you know, and, and use people for experimentation or for, or for a hunting game you know, um, whatever, stuff like that. And I just feel like that's all, like this rolls right into that same atmosphere. Yeah, it's pretty crazy to kind of think about all that stuff. And um, yeah, everything that you're kind of hearing when it comes to the, like the the allegations and everything like that. And then you kind of look at the past and see like you make those kind of connections and it's pretty wild to, to kind of think about all that. And like, yeah, and you know, people in power and that have a lot of money and everything like that. It's, they don't think a lot of the way that uh, other people do. <laughs> That's why they're up there. until they, they get to that level sometimes. So. That's true. Mm-hmm. That is true. And, and I'm not, I'm not convicting him yet, you know, but sure, yeah. also are still valid either way. And like I said before, even if from reading, and I read the whole 67 page. Um, Did you? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. And even if that was consensual, I'm still very disturbed. So that's my opinion. 